Hello to everybody, and thanks for being online for our important PIH lecture. Today, the lecture entitled A Prognostic Atlas for Clinical Medicine will be given by Professor Harry Hemingway. You know our formal rules of conduct that you see depicted here on the slide, so we ask you to kindly turn off your webcam and mic at any time, except you ask questions later on, and send us questions to the chat, um, to the organizer, and we will then coordinate the questions after the talk. Today's lecture, as I indicated, is given by Professor Harry Hemingway, and he's a true leader in the field of health data research. And that's safe to say, both in the national scale and in the international scale, that he's a true leader in this field. He's really the brain behind many large studies, and large meaning here that there are populations comprising several millions of uh, individuals um, in these studies where health data uh, are being linked to find out how disease develops, temporal trends and patterns, uh, of disease onset and development, which is, of course, very important to understand the background um, of average population behavior for which, um, which we need to understand also individual deviations from the average pattern in precision medicine. Health data research links data from primary care, from hospital admissions, um, from registries and also from clinical trials uh, up to death records and uh, is able to integrate then really large data sets given that the healthcare system allows such integration to occur. And um, this is obviously well possible in the United Kingdom, which has a much more centralized healthcare system that we have it in these days in Germany. And thus we've seen a number of really great important studies um, coming out of um, Harry Hemingway's uh, work and that of his team. Uh, today, Harry holds a number of important positions after he studied medicine and public health. He um, became uh, finally professor of clinical epidemiology at the University College London back in 2005 and continues this position. Uh, he acts as honorary consultant in public health for the UCL Hospital National Health, health Service Trust in London since 2007. He's the director of the Institute of Health Informatics at UCL since 2014 and director of something that is called H a High Gods, a, a beautiful acronym which stands for Healthcare Informatics Genomics Omics and data sciences, high guards, a cross cutting theme um, of NIHR Biomedical Research Center at uh, University College London. And he's director, finally, important to mention, of Health Data Research UK based in London. Uh, his um, field of research is mostly in um, the context of cardiovascular diseases, but um, he's, of course, also interested in in many other topics and he has really a um, profound track record with an H index of now I think more than 80. So today we are happy to have him with us. Not only today, he's actually available in Berlin with substantial amounts of time since he's being married to Claudia Langenberg, who we are proud to have with us as professor appointed in the BIH and the Charité, and while he continues his outstanding work in the UK, of course. So, Harry, the stage is yours, and one more important technical remark maybe before you begin. Um, I'll have to leave, unfortunately, in about uh, five minutes uh, because we have another committee in parallel, but um, I'm very grateful to Christoph von Kalle that he will be the moderator of this meeting and of this talk. So um, now the, um, I give the mic over to Harry Hemingway. Professor Baum, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I think if my mother had heard it, she would have said, really? 
I just want to check that people can hear and see the slide. Everything looks fine, Harry. Thank you. Terrific. Okay. okay. So it, it's a privilege and honor to uh, deliver a lecture in the uh, Frontiers in Translational Medicine Scientific and Structural Challenges uh, series, uh, because what I would like to talk about are some initial steps towards a prognostic atlas uh, for clinical medicine. And I think there are many uh, challenges along that path. So let's start off with a big structural uh, question. Uh, what do doctors do? What do hospitals do? So they organize themselves in part uh, around clinical specialties. And here is the uh, Charité uh, campus uh, tower with the associated clinical specialties. The same model, of course, is replicated uh, around the world. An elegant work from uh, Professor Felix Balzer at Charité has shown how, of course, doctors not only treat patients, they keep records. The electronic health record data, which is the subject of this talk. So here you see the flows of patients uh, into the Charité among different wards and, and out to discharge rehabilitation. And in a small number of cases, of course, uh, to an adverse uh, outcome. This is profoundly important that hospitals, of course, accumulate as a system data on all patients. And here, before people get to hospital, they come from home. So for the geographically astute amongst you, you may recognize that the squiggly line going left to right in the middle of this picture is the River Thames. So this is the hospital I work at, and these are the patient flows from four o'clock in the morning, time at the right-hand side, in real time, different types of patients, different types of admissions, discharges, and so on, uh, to University College London uh, hospitals, which is actually five hospitals together sitting at the heart of, of London, right close to the British Library and British Museum. So this talk really started uh, with an email that I received sitting in Schoenberg in a park uh, on the data, all the data, from everybody uh, in England. And that email, I'm going to show you the results of its counts, but these counts are, I think, important. So clinicians diagnose diseases, they write it down. So this is raw data, and this is what the experience of those people alive in England the day before the pandemic struck their hospitalization experience. So it's pretty much everybody in England, 56 million people, and there's about 250 million uh, hospital uh, admissions here. And what this shows, a uh, unique international classification of disease codes along the bottom and on a log scale, the numbers of patients, it shows that across clinical specialties here, I, I make no apologies for the rainbow, across clinical specialties, this is an important sense uh, what doctors do. And this is a tribute, this slide, this is a tribute to the work of uh, Kathy Sudlow, uh, who has brought these data into a state where they are accessible for researchers, and Professor Spiros Danaxis, who's recently been on a, 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 an exchange uh, here, at, here at the Charité. So what this shows is that, of course, you won't be surprised. There is no such thing as a separate common and rare disease, uh, as it were. Of course, there is, uh, there is a continuum, and that continuum exists uh, pretty much for every uh, clinical specialty. So the question when I received those counts uh, was, well, what can we do with these data? Now, the permissions to work on these data are linked to uh, COVID research. And a fundamental question in COVID research is to say which underlying diseases may predispose uh, people to uh, more or worse outcome if, if infected. And the question comes of, well, what do we mean by an underlying disease? So if we stand back and expand our opening question, I think it's fair to say that healthcare systems systems across the world know remarkably little about which patients have which diseases, in which combinations, and with outcomes. And there are many reasons for that. 
uh, not least the fact that we have not currently got a reference catalogue of what we call disease that is computable and implementable and usable um, amongst, uh, amongst other reasons. I, I guess a second reason would be we have the culture of doing things one disease at a time. So I think there's some international uh, unmet need if your perspective is you know, people like me, a patient's perspective or patients like mine, a clinician's perspective, existing risk information has low coverage. That, that is clear. Estimate less than 5% of diseases have any kind of prognostic model. These are rarely uh, developed with patients uh, in mind. They are commonly uh, developed in a one disease uh, full stop approach. And clearly, uh, the patients, particularly at Charité, are complex. They have uh, more than one uh, condition that materially uh, influences treatment. And this, this one disease at a time approach without a, a systematic uh, framework for generating uh, prognostic insights. And if one stands back and says, is there a, a point of principle here? I think there is. Uh, if one goes to the, the medical ethics or codes of conduct or uh, du duties of a doctor, I reminded myself what the General Medical Council and what the American Medical Association say, and it's very strong. You must share information on likely progression. Patients have the right uh, to discuss risks. So despite these um, homilies, as it were, we clearly are not doing this in a data-driven way. The question arises is, can we do this in some way systematically for each and every disease? And adopt a democratic approach in which each disease, as it were, gets the same vote. Uh, because these questions about prognosis are ubiquitous. They're not private to any <laughs> private to any one disease. And acknowledging the, the long tail of clinical medicine, this is the same data I showed earlier, only not log transformed. So of course, a very large number of people, a very small number of people uh, have a very large number of uh, different um, diseases. We've known that for, uh, of course, for, for, for many decades. It is that the opportunity to get at that through systematic data-driven approaches are emerging uh, rapidly. So uh, a, a favorite word in, uh, of, of, uh, of mine is all. Uh, can we get at all specialties? Can we get at all clinicians? And all clinicians pretty much map to a specialty. Um, in fact, in, in, in the UK, you cannot be a clinician without being on a specialist uh, register uh, all diseases and all people with diseases so there's a there's a set of challenges uh, relevant i think i hope to this uh, lecture series this interest in prognosis uh, is a long-standing uh, interest uh, of mine and a group of collaborators i had a privilege of working with uh, an international group um, entitled the prognosis uh, research strategy a group that published this series of papers back in 2013 and that made many recommendations and one of which was that there was a, a massive need for more and more actionable uh, research in uh, disease uh, prediction and disease uh, progression. So I want in this talk to take us on a bit of a journey uh, from uh, serendipity or, or one disease at a time approaches uh, to, to systems approaches. I'm very minded that in the worlds of uh, genomic medicine and molecular medicine, the idea of systematic genome-wide, phenome-wide, uh, proteome-wide uh, approaches is established. It's been established for more than 15 years. Uh, one would seldom now propose a uh, you know, a candidate one gene at a time uh, study in isolation. But that same approach to all, I think, has been lacking so far in terms of uh, prognosis. So here's a, a journey from one disease through a small number of diseases to hundreds to, to, to all. Um, and I'll give you some examples uh, along the way. 
So let's start off with the very important approach, of course, uh, will it, enduringly important of considering uh, one uh, disease at a time. And I'm seeing this all the time through the lens of uh, health data. So here's an example, one disease, uh, angiographic coronary artery disease. The clinical data here were from uh, five hospitals uh, in London. This is where I came across the, uh, the, the observation that we essentially needed to weigh uh, the paper case notes in order to understand um, what the likely course of disease would be for a particular individual. I mean, the specific hypothesis for this work was that one could distill clinical expertise using the formal uh, RAND uh, appropriateness criteria uh, method in order to answer questions of effectiveness that randomized controlled trials had not answered and would not foreseeably uh, answer. So that was the question. I guess I'm interested for this talk uh, more about the approach. I mean, the answer was, yes, those experts could do this, and you'll see that uh, those who are appropriate for coronary artery bypass graft who did and didn't get it, did um, you, know, you did better if you got the coronary artery bypass graft than, than if you did not. Um, but the approach is important here because this, I think for the first time in England, was using health record data to pick up the, uh, the outcomes. Another example, one disease, also angina, here really motivated by using whole country data, so these clinical data. The country here is, is Finland, uh, most wonderful experience of receiving very old fashioned now, wouldn't happen now, a CD uh, sent in the post. And here the question was about um, sex differences. So was the impact of people with uh, sex, uh, test positive angina um, higher, lower, or about the same in women compared with men. And here, this shows that in relative terms, it was at either higher at younger ages or about the same in women than men. And this helped put uh, women more firmly on the map back in those distant days when people thought that angina was uh, principally a disease of, of men. Another example of, of one disease work, this is acute myocardial infarction. Here, the data uh, again, a um, whole country nationwide data in UK uh, and, and Sweden. Here, uh, disease registries, um, but to point out that this is uh, manual data entry, so it's not part of the electronic health record. And I guess we would all foresee, the, the disease registries are hugely important, but I guess we would all foresee a time when they no longer are needed because they have, apart from being uh, costly, they have a a monomorbid focus. So if they're done out with the agnostic data of an electronic health record, there are um, limits to what one could know about the uh, prognosis and outcome of diseases. So this was uh, finding, you know, I, I often, when I showed this those years back in 2014, I said that this is something to be proud of that the UK could demonstrate that it was in a bad position because people lazily uh, use the phrase uh, world class. Uh, certainly some of my colleagues uh, lazily use the phrase world class and the question always is prove it. And so the ability to prove it with data is what I think um, one should strive for and I think the UK has done some worthwhile things in terms of the registries. Of course the fact that uh, outcomes in Sweden were better is something to uh, shape uh, policy and indeed that did. So let's move on to the 12 diseases. So just briefly, so can we unpack the cardiovascular disease? So in a small sample from England uh, looking at instead of the lump of a cardiovascular disease, look at the, you know, split that out into peer 12 different cardiovascular diseases and look at the influence of peer systolic and diastolic blood pressure on those, on, on those events. So what did that show? It showed that the risks differed um, profoundly uh, across diseases. So if you look at the example of abdominal aortic aneurysm here, the uh, discordance between systolic and diastolic effects which are actually going the opposite direction uh, 
in peripheral arterial disease than the disease above that. And you'll see that many of those diseases differ, uh, as it were, substantially from the, the pooled effect. It also said something about thresholds, which informed uh, lower thresholds for diagnosing hypertension. Now onto the many common diseases. Um, Spirostonaxis, Valerie Kwan and others um, stimulated a look at um, some 308 of the most common physical and mental health um, conditions using these linked uh, health record data. And just to point out the, the, the kind of all nature of this, although it's still you know small sample of the English population, it is going from um, cradle to grave, from age zero to age, it says 80 plus there, but obviously we have a number of centenarians and, uh, and older. And here's a, an animation to show how different conditions at different ages, what we all know one at a time, this is no sort of surprise, the advance here is to be able to do this comparatively and systematically. That's the, um, that's the, the point here. And how are we able to do this? So the kind of methods deeply matter. The structural challenge here is part about methods and it's part about culture. So here's a, a methodological point, which is raw electronic health record data looks like um, a mess, roughly speaking. It doesn't even look as neat as Lego bricks uh, to many people looking at it. And what the uh, one challenge is to convert those raw EHR data into something useful. Uh, and one aspect of that is so-called EHR uh, phenotyping. So one can get at replicable, reusable um, combinations of those Lego bricks, as it were, uh, that will tell us something uh, important about disease um, status, severity, onset and, and certainty, for example. So one of the things that, again, you know, Spiros and Axis has been uh, leading these efforts uh, amongst others is to put that into an open uh, library. Um, here is the, the, the current version of that library. Um, nothing like giving a talk for realizing that the website has got um, a kind of mistake on it. So if you look at the top left hand corner, um, uh, tools and phenotype typing algorithms for UK electronic health records. Well, if I thought this was about UK electronic health records, I'd get my hat and coat. Uh, this is about health records um, and defining health and disease using clinical terminologies that are used widely internationally. So the application maybe often is here in uh, the UK in, into data, but the approaches and the methods, if they're not international, they are of, uh, I think, modest, if any, value whatsoever. So I'll correct that on the website. And um, so what does that give uh, a potential user? Here's an example. So if you drill down on asthma, there are some 700 uh, phenotypes in the library uh, at the minute. If you drill down on asthma, you see that um, you can download the, the data in CSV or JSON XML. You can see uh, which data sources the uh, phenotype has been applied to, which uh, coding systems, clinical terminologies uh, have been uh, used and published validations uh, where they exist. And that pattern is, is repeated, of course, for, for, for all those phenotypes. That's got about, I think, currently about 2,000 users uh, a month. Why so low? Why so low? Because uh, that is researcher to researcher. And I hope you're getting the spirit uh, from my comments that I think... Uh, it's the clinical specialist and the patient who are center stage here. Um, so uh, what, the key question always uh, is data quality, data quality, data quality, validation, validation, validation. So where do these health data provide useful signal and where are they not useful? And so here are some uh, layers in this uh, cake as it were, things that we may want to, we, we do do to uh, secure understanding of the validity of a particular phenotype. So first off, specialist adjudication versus a standard, again, the specialist. Secondly, the clinical relevance, you know, does this phenotype map to something that we care about? For example, clinical practice guidelines. Thirdly, as a validation, um, does the prognosis uh, 
look um, plausible. If you have a heart failure phenotype and the one year mortality is 3%, you have not got a heart failure phenotype. Um, can you replicate known genetic or other molecular uh, etiological uh, associations? Um, do the data uh, demonstrate concordance across different healthcare settings, primary, secondary, tertiary care? Are the, um, are the phenotypes transportable across healthcare systems and nations? Now, those are all uh, relevant uh, validations. And, you know, nobody went to heaven on a validation, you know. <laughs> You know, this is what uh, the important part of uh, building up uh, research and, and science. So I, I guess I look at that as those same questions, those same questions which build confidence in the data are also use cases and also provide insights uh, from the EHR phenotypes. And indeed, in an iterative way, in, in doing it, one may want to uh, refine and improve those phenotypes. So, for example, the first, the top player there, the specialist adjudication versus standard, if one regards that as simply producing some positive predictive values, uh, that's just validation. But if it's part of a feedback loop where the specialist is engaged and, uh, and actually themselves uh, will, working in their systems, be part of improving the data quality, that's then uh, a use case uh, and an insight. So because we had the platform, the uh, phenotype library with hundreds of disease phenotypes, we were able to respond uh, early in the pandemic. I just reminded myself of the Financial Times on the left-hand side there. Um, it says, uh, did it say that? It said somewhere on there. Um, I should have highlighted it. Sorry, I've, I've obviously cropped it out. Um, the, the FT reported the paper that we did do in 72 hours from start to submission on the uh, preprint on, on MedArchive. Uh, the FT did call it an instant analysis. Uh, and certainly epidemiologists up until the pandemic have been, I think, rarely if ever been accused of doing uh, rapid or instant analyses. Okay, but so we, we, we produced this uh, estimates of excess one-year mortality uh, associated with uh, the pandemic according to baseline risk in underlying conditions. And that was the key, uh, the key step, if you like, a kind of pre-proto prognostic atlas. And so the little bit of our shiny that we put up um, that got, you know, 1.4 million page views simply allows a person to enter any underlying conditions top left, um, other conditions, age uh, and, and sex, and calculate both a baseline risk, um, and uh, which is uh, in orange, and an excess risk yeah, in red under different uh, pandemic assumptions. And on the right-hand side, what you see is the kind of comorbidity uh, pattern uh, for, for these patients. So that piqued our interest. If one could do it for a small number of conditions here, could we uh, extend that out uh, to other conditions? So then we went to uh, cancer. And when we saw back in uh, April of 2020, this catastrophic, on the left-hand side, this catastrophic drop in urgent uh, referrals for cancer diagnosis, which of course was seen uh, in, in many healthcare settings uh, around the world, what we were able to do was to kind of link that to uh, modeled uh, excess uh, mortality. So if you like a, a canary in the mine uh, approach, which was, um, which was, I think, of some value, it, 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 it attracted sustained media attention with a, a BBC uh, documentary and the subsequent um, NHS recovery plan in July 2020 uh, prioritized cancer, the return of, of, of cancer services. So, for the key step up part of this talk, I want to say that going back to that email that I received on in August of this year, is this uh, opportunity um, to step up in the scale and depth of data which is accessible um, by researchers. So here's a, a COVID-19 example. So in the uh, population of England, the ability to map the cases 
uh, so 56 million population, but then the others are all cases. So in primary care, 2.36 million cases, positive tests, 3.1 million, deaths, 138,000. So, you know, we were not wrong in our kind of March 2020 predictions. Um, hospitalizations, 364,000. Uh, hundred thousand. So this shows it's it's simple, but I think elegant. It shows how across different parts of the health system the data uh, can be linked up, and linked up, of course, to to provide um, insight. So here, just just posted this. So uh, Johan's just posted this. So here, the COVID trajectories in 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 the population of England. I just draw attention to one um, finding that. Those people, the red line in both of those couple of Maya curves. So on the left, it's wave one, on the right, it's wave two. And of course, you'll see that the red line is not very different. And this is uh, mortality in people receiving critical care outside of intensive um, care unit. And there's a lot of uh, discussion about that, but it's the kind of thing that one can uh, demonstrate when one has the scale of data and one is able to get there are 10 different severity phenotypes uh, in these COVID-19 trajectories. So now let's get on to uh, all diseases uh, across the common rare disease spectrum that leave a digital trace. So this is how do we turn these data on everybody into something useful. So ICD-10 is great it's the most widely used clinical terminology. It's sorted into chapters, which are helpful. Um, the codes are pretty used. So about 12,000 of the 17,000 codes are used in practice. And what I learned back in August is, oh my word, rare diseases, things which are uncommon, these codes do get used in a plausible uh, way. But remarkably, <laughs> ICD-10, despite its name, does not readily classify diseases. One disease may have many leaf codes. Uh, one disease may have codes which are kind of fragmented. They're across multiple chapters. Um, one code can map to many diseases, and some codes are just not diseases at all. So that's kind of a bit frustrating. And, and secondly, that ICD-10 does not map to clinical specialties. So here's an example. So disease of the circulatory system maps to at least seven different clinical specialties. So what we've done in, in the DECODES work that Spiris Danaxis is, is leading is to go from ICD-10 chapter to clinical specialty. And this is the draft of how these uh, kind of map out uh, across uh, clinical specialties. So we're getting to around about uh, 5,000 unique uh, disease fee codes, of which about 3,000 are leaf codes. 82 are kind of other specified, rather interesting label, because uh, only 43 of those offer uh, specifications uh, in the rubric. And this matters for multiple reasons, not just clinical care. Of course, uh, pharma uh, will distribute its uh, R&D in its portfolio across um, therapeutic areas uh, for, for obvious reasons. So the key thing that we're building is, uh, it, I think it's not only a catalog, but it's a, a set of review tools. Who needs to own and author this catalog on which the prognostic atlas is built? It's specialists. And so here's an excerpt uh, from the kind of review uh, process for ICD-10. So send this to a um, cardiac electrophysiology person, and we're asking a bunch of questions. Does this, uh, do these codes and these groupings of codes make sense? So for example, you can click on the other specified cardiac dysrhythmias, uh, uh, cardiac arrhythmias, you'll see there's one ICD code, which in the rubric mentions these other things. And, you're, and there are 59,000 people in England with this, uh, this code. And that is the probably most important element on this slide, is giving the clinician the codes with some data. Codes without data, boring, uninteresting, sophistry. Codes with data, tell me more. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it indifferent? But clinicians engage. So that is the step, I think, uh, up and forward. 
So, and in addition, then uh, can link to uh, author codes uh, for from rare disease um, to, to kind of further specify that. And of course, although it's not available nationally, uh, we're really interested in the uh, use of SNOMED CT codes, a common language uh, across primary and secondary care, higher clinical resolution, and could add a substantial um, value. And the Nuke Shah is building out the clinical specialty uh, review tools uh, for SNOMED um, CT, and that allows the clinician very directly to engage in those small number of diseases about which they are expert uh, and, and really care. Further focus is to say 3,000 diseases, that's a lot. Is it really, is it really true? Can we, can we focus that in some way? Can we operationalize the, the treatable disease zone? Uh, I think we can. Um, if one takes maybe two criteria, one is, is the disease the subject of an evidence-based uh, clinical practice guideline, and or is it um, treated uh, with an orphan medication approved by uh, FDA, EMA, or MHRI? And as a ballpark, we think that whittles the uh, treatable disease aim to something like 700 diseases. So where are we up to? I think we're drafting a clinically useful reference catalog. So from these 22 uh, heterogeneous ICD-10 chapters into clinical specialties with review tools, from these about 12,000 leaf codes, which are highly heterogeneous, into something much more clinically reviewable, uh, about 3,000 leaf codes, and prioritizing the treatable disease. You're probably thinking, well, this sounds like you're developing a, a number of underpinning elements to, to the atlas, the diseases, the data, the doctors, the guideline bodies, the charities even, the, the, the kind of patients who uh, have groups that, uh, the, the, the bodies that represent um, patients, uh, often disease specific. So yeah, absolutely. So this is a, a build to a, to a knowledge graph. Here are the specialties. Um, the treatable disease zone uh, mapped to each of those clinical specialties, the data mapped to those uh, diseases, the guideline generating bodies. The beauty there is there aren't that many. There's less than 200. And guess what? The next lot of guidelines will come out from almost certainly an existing US, European, UK, other um, guideline bodies. Here's an interesting point. Uh, I, in many hospitals publish a kind of A to Z of the individual clinicians and their interests, which of course are often super focused on one disease or two diseases or three diseases. And of course, uh, through data, oftentimes we can uh, map that and compute that into the knowledge graph. And there are hundreds of disease specific uh, charities all seeking, I think, often all seeking information on outcomes. So to finish up the talk, I just want to share some initial uh, views of what the Atlas prototype uh, looks like. So here displayed as a circus plot where the clinical specialties are the chromosomes in the outermost uh, track. And in a sense, as you can, I hope, tell, one can choose what to display on the, on the inner tracks. Each radius, of course, is one uh, disease here. So this is um, uh, fantastic work from Alvina uh, Lai and, and, and colleagues here. So let me explode one example, same picture as before. So primary pulmonary hypertension, uh, 36,000 people in England have this prevalence of 6.4 per 10,000. So it, although it's often called a rare disease, it clearly exceeds the uh, rare disease threshold. And here we map the mortality, the prevalence, the age, other things we could we could bring in there. I'll come show it. It's rather a subtle difference here. On the, on the left hand side, the conditions are ranked by a prevalence, which is the magenta color. On the right hand side, the, they're ranked by a mortality, which is the, the green track here. And of course, the uh, cross specialty nature of multimorbidity is quite remarkable for how. Uh, pre uh, how common it is, here's the example of some 20 or 30 cancers, common cancers, uh, but also how people, uh, if I can be 
frank, uh, sort of choose to ignore it when talking about um, outcome. So here's some results of the, uh, and just in some cardiovascular um, fee codes, how the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has differentially uh, affected conditions. So this is the uh, risk uh, of, of dying uh, in infection separately in, in each of these couple of, well, there's 143 conditions here. And you see that the very high relative risks for polyarteritis, nodosa, and vaginus uh, granulomatosis, eightfold uh, risks, and uh, much weaker, lower relative risks uh, with infection for, uh, for example, embolism and thrombosis of, of the renal um, vein. So one of the things we can do with the prognostic atlas is uh, put the, a frequency map of disease mapped to clinical specialty. So likened again to the chromosome where the uh, common diseases above the threshold of five per 10,000 uh, can, be, can be mapped uh, in, in detail and the uh, rare diseases uh, mapped in, in, in detail here. And this relative abundance is novel. Uh, of course, there are one at a time incomparable estimates of abundance that uh, proliferate in literature, but the idea of a systematic relative abundance and systematic relative uh, prognosis uh, is, is, a, is a new endeavour. Of course, people have uh, worked really hard on developing existing uh, prognostic models. Um, I've said before, they're available for rather few diseases. They proliferate for some diseases. There are more than 50 for heart failure, for example. But it is quite remarkable how clinical practice guidelines seldom engage in prognosis or, or prognosis, prognostic models. And in practice, quite remarkable how clinicians commonly say in frank moments, do you know what? I'm in the dark. I mean, I'm saying what I think is likely to be the case based on my experience, which is really important, but I don't have data. So I think there is a real opportunity for uh, engineered prognostic models across the disease zone. And these models could take a, a, a common form. I think in the near term where we are doing this is, is getting on with the common form of age, index condition and coexisting conditions, those of data available in everybody. But of course, uh, we want to complement that uh, with the incremental prognostic value uh, for a given purpose of molecular and other uh, information. And here I would highlight uh, Charité work uh, led by Mike Pietzner and Claudia Langenberg, elegantly bringing together the uh, more alls, I have to say, uh, genomic variation uh, and the proteomic consequences of that variation linked to an agnostic approach of which diseases uh, are, are causally related. And that, again, uses uh, the, the P codes, uses uh, agnostic data from all uh, diagnosed disease. Here the focus is on understanding a disease mechanism for, for example, for uh, identifying drug targets, but these same approaches I think are likely to contribute importantly uh, to uh, prediction. So I hope that one can see that the potential uses of an atlas uh, driven by patients and specialists uh, are many um, can answer a, a, a range of questions, uh, which oftentimes are ubiquitous. They're kind of standing questions. For example, how has the pandemic affected my chances of survival? Um, I think there's a need for health systems to embed so-called canaries in the mine in the system. You know, we've talked about shared decision-making between the doctor and patient for many, many decades and, and progress has been slow. Uh, Doctors have a duty uh, to do um, clinical audit, understand the quality of the care that um, care that they give, and, and rather cheekily to name the Keogh principle. So uh, Bruce Keogh was the medical director of the NHS for 10 years, and I think he taught many that uh, data is only good when clinicians look at it. Quality of care is only good when you look at the data. Sounds simple, but he did it, and he did it in the 1990s and the 20th, uh, early part of the, the millennium. And I think we can learn a lot from that principle. 
And of course, your ingenuity, I'm sure, would consider many other potential uses of, of, of prognostic atlas. So by way of conclusion, I think that uh, a prognostic atlas across clinical medicine, if it is specialist and patient driven, um, has become feasible in the light of current data opportunities. There are many challenges, but I think it is, it is feasible. I think I would end with a question, which is, if it is the duty of doctors and the right of patients to understand the likely course of disease, then is this maybe, in addition, a responsibility? Thank you all for your attention. I really look forward to your questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Harry, for a beautiful presentation. Um, yet another Hemingway who explains in short, beautiful sentences the world to us. Um, wonderful. Uh, um, if I may, um, as the questions are coming in through the chat, but maybe I can get started with a couple of provocative ones. Um, and um, I must admit that I'm coming from a developing nation in terms of health data, as you know. Uh, the situation in Germany is much poorer than um, the one in the UK. Um, what of this that you have shown would actually be actionable? And what of this would go beyond, and I probably see it more in the rare diseases than in the common one, um, what would be information that an experienced attending couldn't see in a patient who is coming, walking, or limping through the door? So what is, what is new and what is actionable um, from, from what you just described? So, so three points. So, so firstly, uh, I, I don't accept your opening comment about a uh, developing nation. Uh, quite, quite the opposite. I think that in, in Germany, uh, a number of initiatives, you know, HiMed amongst others, there are really important informatic initiatives. Specifically at Charité, the data exists today. Uh, my understanding, having had just the briefest of looks, is that the health data platform that's been established is outstanding. Uh, and uh, the data are ICD-10 coded. Uh, and that, under the Keo principle, start today and look at the data driven by system-wide uh, questions. So you're in a rich position. So that's the first point. The second point is, uh, what do we mean by actionable? If, if I'm frank, I've changed my view on that. I think for many years, I thought actionable meant clinical decisions. Clinical decisions are hard. But why do I know that? I know that because of I, we can demonstrate that empirically how rubbish we all are at um, developing, validating useful prognostic models or information. It's been shown time and time again that it's fish and chip paper. The, 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 the model dies in the paper. And the same is true, if I can be frank, of, of much of artificial intelligence inquiry um, outside of, of, of imaging analysis, is that the, 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 the model dies in the paper. So that makes me think, so what do we mean by actionability? I, say, I think what is actionable is to reflect back to a clinical specialty some really simple things. I hate to say it. I think if you can reflect back to a clinical specialty in practice, the relative abundance of these diagnoses is this. That matters because everybody's flying in the dark. I don't, the, the, the cardiologist, it's the first time we've had access to this scale of data and the ability to know what's common, what's rare, what's medium rare, what's ultra rare, systematically, that is novel. And so I think that's also actionable. It's actionable at a number of levels, including research funding. So a figure I'll show you next time is the relationship of disease frequency or mortality to research interest marked by publications. So that's actionable. And the, and the third part is what is new. I, I, I think, you know, we always, you know, our job is to over egg what is new, right? <laughs> that's how we get grants. So I think a lot of what I'm showing here is deeply not new. Uh, it's, it's, it's apart from the approach. It's scaling up what we already know and clinicians and patients know uh, to be uh, important. 
now I'm going to slightly disagree with myself and say, but you know, I couldn't have given this talk uh, six months ago. Yeah, I mean, that's very interesting. So what I wanted to see, and of course, with epidemiology, has the word epidemic in its name. So we've we've learned. I think all of us have learned a lot in, in COVID and. Uh, uh, we, um, the developing nation part that I was referring to were not as much the single institutions which are up there with the rest of them in, in many areas, but uh, the health system as a whole. Um, I see the problem, for example, that we have DRGs and so certain ICD diagnosis groups are actually, uh, if you wish, uh, subsidized and therefore appear more frequently than they're probably actually due to appear, or also the order in sort of the leading and the, and the um, comorbidities are you know, perhaps skewed in some of these catalogs. Um, I also think that, of course, the COVID data shows that um, you also need a little bit more of data in terms of not just the diagnosis, but also the severity of the disease, perhaps some lab values. And so I wanted to get your comment um, a little bit in an ideal scenario where more of the health data and the actual sort of real-time data of the clinical care becomes available, like lab values or um, other uh, other. Um, uh, um, uh, test results. Um, do you think that could be yet another jump forward? And if so, if we're aiming for the 21st century, shouldn't we aim for a more sort of holistic data concept rather than just the formal diagnosis eventually? I, 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 I strongly agree with all the above. Um, I, I, you know why? why um, you know why Rob Banks? That's where the money is. Why, why start with ICD-10 data? Because that is the only data I think that is available at scale in multiple systems internationally. So that's why start there. Of course it's only the start but that's why I emphasized um, this is not about a bunch of researchers. The, I emphasize the if we can get the clinical specialties at an individual and organizational level to engage in the the data and the potential uses of data, that is a step forward. Currently, I think that's deeply not the case. So for example, clinical practice guidelines virtually never say anything about, oh, by the way, this, this guideline is all about this disease. You might want to uh, code it. Here's a, here's, a good, here's a recommended way to code it in the data. Very, very rarely do, do they say that. So I think you know the DRG problem, the quality of data problem and so on, which is ubiquitous, that is, is, do we wait for our employers to solve that problem, as it were? We can wait till hell freezes over. Or do we wait for clinicians to say, you know what? I really care about primary pulmonary hypertension. And if half of it's been miscoded elsewhere for you know, billing reasons, I'm going to do something about it. The system would listen. Um, and, and your point about you know, deeper data, of course. And so the near-term prospects um, in, in uh, well, I, I think the most tractable prospects there uh, are threefold, uh, are, you know, blood laboratory values, um, procedures uh, and medications. So we have all of those in, 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 the, in the primary care data uh, in the UK with some gaps. I think much harder, but really important uh, is the imaging data at scale. But the reason I didn't mention those is because if the question is, prognosis. I think the, the kind of medium term opportunity for molecular understanding to put us a step forward, I think is really exciting. Yeah, um, one of the questions that, that arose um, um, also in part of the chat was um, uh, the, the, the question of the common language that you referred to earlier and the systems being able to exchange. Um, that is uh, something that I think a lot of us find very fascinating. Um, could you allude to, do you think that SNOMED is, is the way to go? What, what, other, what other steps do you see um, that, that we should have in terms of an interchangeable, um, uh, you know, um, uh, pl plausible um, common language of, of encoding such things? So I, I would defer to wiser, wiser brains. I mean, Sylvia Toon in, in Charité, amongst others, 
I, I think SNOMED is very interesting. It certainly uh, really helps to fix a UK problem. Uh, UK has a deep problem, if I may, in that it has the separation of primary and secondary care. Uh, so literally, uh, up until recently, that meant that primary care was coded using read codes, which were essentially a UK parochial thing, um, and hospital data was coded with ICD-10. That's changed dramatically. So now we have SNOMED coded data on, um, I, 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 I don't know if it's the whole population, but large tens of millions of people in, in primary care, and our own hospital does SNOMED coding of all aspects of, of care in hospital, but not yet in, in outpatients. So it's a common language that, that's, um, for, for, from a UK perspective, is super attractive because it's an international standard. But I'd love to hear what uh, you know, Charité's... Uh, kind of, what, what yeah, Charité that's, is really that's an expression from the chat, actually. So uh, an organization like ours, Charité, um, Claudia Langenberg is asking, um, for, for the hospital of, of a size of Charité or any of the larger, um, more sophisticated um, health and research organizations, what would be your vision, how, how to go forward, how to drive this? Um, uh, I, I, I would, would return to the Keogh principle. Um, use and use today, all data, all the time. Because it's only through use that you engage interest and it's only through interest that you engage the, the kind of relevant improvements. And by use, I mean at that the, the, the sweet spot of the clinician and the researcher. And it is it is remarkable to me how uh, little these data are are, are used in, in in the UK. And and the simple reason for that, I think, is or there, were, there are several reasons, but one reason is that people simply don't know that the data are there. So I gave you that primary pulmonary hypertension example. So knowing that there are 59,000 people alive in England with that diagnosis, guess what? I think there are quite a few people who are interested in that disease who'd say, well, why didn't you tell me that before? And now what can I do? And you multiply that across um, maybe 3,000 diseases and you have a tide that floats many boats. So use and use today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that is actually a beautiful summary um, of your presentation and um, of the um, of the um, information that you have provided. Um, I think it could also be a guiding light for what we do. Um, often the anticipated uh, fear of processing too much data is, I think, blocking us from thinking in that way. Um, and I really uh, strongly under, would like to underline, um, and again, I think I haven't seen it as clearly as you have pointed it out today, how important this is for patients and their survival, um, what, what you just said and also what you showed to us. So um, with that said, I would Thank you very much again for the presentation. I'm sure you'll be okay with participants contacting you about um, more detailed information directly. Uh, we have to refer yeah. some of the questions out. Um, and uh, Harry, thank you very much again for a wonderful presentation. Um, and, and thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your uh, attention. Please take note of the next uh, um, BIH lecture on December 17th um, in the Christmas uh, spirit um, by um, Matthias Mutov, uh, and we're looking forward to that one as well. Thank you very much.